Yo, 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 what's going on, everyone? And welcome to the podcast called Getting to Know God. This is the place where we look to the scriptures and only the scriptures to know the one true living God of the Bible, letting him speak for himself in his word through the Psalms. I'm Brandon, also known as Pastor B-Side, and today we're going to look at the attributes of God as the Lord describes them in Psalm 21. Now, this is the fourth part of our four-part study through Psalm 21. So if you haven't heard the first three parts, (laughs) you should probably go back and check those out first. The title for our study today is called The Desire of God's Heart. Now, last episode was called The Desire of Our Hearts, and we learned about what the Bible says our desires should be. In this episode, we're going to look at what God wants. So if you've ever wondered, what does God want from my life? Well, here you go. But real quick, before we get started, I just wanted to remind you that if you've been digging on these studies, I want to ask you a favor. I need you to take a second and hit that share button. Maybe even right now if you can. You should all know by now that a simple tap of a button gets information out into the world, right? What better information to share than the truth of God's word? Look, hitting that share button to your social accounts could help put the true gospel of Jesus Christ in front of someone's eyes, maybe even for the first time, or encourage a believer who really needs it. It's time that we as Christians take a more proactive role in helping the true and full gospel of Jesus Christ get out into the world. And this is a pretty simple way to do that. Amen? So enough of that. Let's check out these verses. In Psalm 21, here's what the Bible says. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. The king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord, and in your salvation how greatly shall he rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire. And have not withheld the request of his lips, Selah. For you meet him with the blessings of goodness. You set a crown of pure gold upon his head. He asked life from you, and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great in your salvation. Honor and majesty you have placed upon him. For you have made him most blessed forever. You have made him exceedingly glad with your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. And through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Your hand will find all your enemies. Your right hand will find those who hate you. You shall make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Their offspring you shall destroy from the earth, and their descendants from among the sons of men. For they intended evil against you. They devised a plot which they are not able to perform. Therefore, You will make them turn their back. You will make ready your arrows on your string towards their faces. Be exalted, O Lord, in your own strength. We will sing and praise your power. Whoa. So the Bible teaches that God is willing to fulfill the desire of our hearts when our desires match his desires, right? If you want to hear more about that, check out the last episode. Now, this seems simple enough, right? The truth is, though, it's kind of tough and it's kind of complicated, There are two important things that we have to think about here. First, we need to know what God's desires are so that our hearts can be aligned with his, right? That makes sense. And the second thing is we need to understand how God is the one that actually aligns our hearts to his. This is not a work that we can do for ourselves. Look, God is eternal and spiritual in nature. We're not. It's not possible to know his nature and align ourselves to it unless he's supernaturally revealed it to us and then did that work on our behalf. Now, when he does, he's the one who does all of the necessary things to conform our fleshly nature into the image of his eternal and spiritual nature. Jesus referred to this process as spiritual regeneration when he said that we all needed to be born again in John chapter 3. This is a spiritual process that Jesus provokes by the work of his spirit according to the will of the Father. So you see, Father, Son, Holy Spirit working together to get this done. So this is the only way to align the desires of our hearts with God's. And when we're in sync like that, then we're able to enjoy the benefits that the Bible talks about. Now, the testimony of Psalm 21, verses 8 through 13, explains what God's desires are, but it does so 
by explaining the true inner desires of the triumphant or victorious king. Psalm 21 explains that the triumphant king is the one appointed by God to lead his people, but this king trusts in and depends on the Lord to do that job. The Lord gives the king the desire of his heart, but only because the king desires the things that God desires. The testimony of Psalm 21 verses 8 through 13 explains what the king ultimately desired in his heart. And that desire, in turn, reveals to us the true focus and desire of God himself. You see how that works? So first, it's important to remember that the foundation of the king's desire was based on receiving eternal life from God, right? Again, we talked a lot about that in the last episode. The king asked for life and received eternal life from God according to God's unique, eternally self-existing, and self-sustaining nature. The victorious king that lives by faith in God knows and acknowledges that God is transcendent in nature and is uniquely qualified and gracious to provide eternal life. So the king relied on the transformative power of God to change his naturally corrupted and weak soul into a soul that God saw with honor and majesty. The scriptures told us that the presence of God was the cause of this change. Circumstances described in Psalm 21 verses 8 through 13 describe the way that God reveals his presence in order to fulfill the transformation that we all need. When he transforms the condition of our souls, that's when we start to see our hearts become aligned with God. And then we see our own desires fulfilled. Here's the crazy thing though. Here, the Bible says that the desire of the king's heart is fulfilled through the judgments of God. Yeah, you heard that right. Judgment. And look again, here's what verses 8 through 12 say. Your hand will find all your enemies. Your right hand will find those who hate you. You shall make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath and the fire shall devour them. Their offspring you shall destroy from the earth and their descendants from among the sons of men. For they intended evil against you. They devised a plot which they are not able to perform. Therefore, you will make them turn their back. You will make ready your arrows on your string toward their faces. <laughs> if that doesn't speak to judgment, I don't know what does, right? Look, the triumphant victory of the king clearly comes on account of God's own victory. That stems from his judgments upon the wicked. The king is victorious because of the work that God does to bring justice, his justice, into the world. Now, earlier in Psalm 21, the Bible said that the victorious king gains blessing, honor, majesty, and exceeding gladness from God. Sounds good, right? Well, the blessing, honor, majesty, and exceeding gladness that the king gets from trusting the Lord ultimately comes through the conduit of God's judgments. In other words, God's judgments is the cause of these benefits. Now, this is a huge point that we have to understand because it is a constant and consistent truth that we see throughout the Bible. This is a fundamental pattern of God's work with everything that he does. Notice that it's God who will seek out his own enemies, and he does so by his right hand. Now think about this statement in the context of other verses that describe God's right hand. For example, in Exodus chapter 15, verse 6, the Bible says, Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. In Psalm 16, 11, the Bible says, You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 48 verse 10 says, According to your name, O God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Now check this one out. In Psalm 110 verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And then Psalm 110 goes on to say in verse 5, the Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. So then you jump way forward to a verse like Mark 16, verse 19, which says, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, this is referring to Jesus, he, 
was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And then in Acts chapter 2, verses 34 through 36, here's what Peter says in his sermon on the day of Pentecost. He said, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So the Bible teaches that the power and glory of the Father, of God the Father, is administrated out into the world by his right hand. And he does it this way in order to judge the people who oppose and rebel against his purposes and promises. Now, the Bible also teaches that the fulfillment of God's promises through his right hand is how he brings pleasure and joy in eternal life. All of it rests in his right hand. It's crazy because the very hand that destroys is the same hand that produces life, pleasure, and joy, sometimes through the same movement. So only God can determine who will be destroyed or saved from destruction based on how he decides to use his own right hand in the lives of each and every individual. The cool thing is, in either case, whatever the Lord decides to do by his right hand, it's going to be perfect, since his perfect and holy righteousness is shown to us through his right hand. Whether someone is judged and condemned, or they're rewarded with pleasure forevermore and salvation, God is right on both accounts. Now, think about how the Bible personifies God's right hand. For example, in Psalm 110 that we just read, David, King David, the same David who wrote Psalm 21, was able to witness a conversation between the Father and his right hand. Sounds kind of weird and crazy, right? But check it out. The Lord is called Yahweh in the first part of the verse, referring to God the Father. In Psalm 110 verse 1, it also refers to someone that David calls my Lord, which the Father was speaking to. So David is witnessing this conversation between Yahweh and someone that he referred to as his own Lord. Now, the Hebrew word used to describe David's Lord is the word Adonai. That means that Yahweh was speaking to David's Adonai. This is a description of David's master, the one that David submitted himself to as a king greater than himself. The Bible describes David as a man after God's own heart, showing that his Adonai, or his master, had to be God himself because that's the one he was pursuing. God was essentially speaking to himself, making certain declarations about his purposes and desires. And David heard it and then documented it, and that's what Psalm 110 is. Now, according to this conversation in Psalm 110, the father told David's master to sit at his own right hand until the appointed time of his judgments. This means that the father spoke to another version of himself and described that version of himself as his right hand. And he did that all in the context of judgment. Very important. This is why the right hand of God is the source of God's power, wisdom, grace, and of course, his judgments. The right hand of God refers to God himself, right? It's his dominant hand. It's, it's the physical extension of himself that gets things done in the ways that we would confidently use our dominant hand to get things done as well, right? This is the specific part of God that physically carries out the purposes of the Father, the things that he thinks up in his mind. His right hand is how it physically comes to pass. Now, the testimony of Mark chapter 16, verse 19 explains that the disciples, among others, were actually eyewitnesses to Jesus' ascension and saw him ascend like float up into heaven in broad daylight and then was seated, guess where? At the right hand of the Father. So this eyewitness account proves that Jesus is the physical manifestation of God appointed out to carry the Father's purposes, especially concerning judgment. Now, how did Jesus' first coming deal with judgment? Well, when Jesus came into the world the first time, he judged sin by his atoning sacrifice. While he did provide eternal life and forgiveness of sins on the cross, we have to understand that his death was a battle. It was an offensive attack against sin, spiritually speaking. 
His physical death was judgment against all sin. Now, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, again, that we just read, he explained that Jesus was the fulfillment of Psalm 110. This means that while Jesus came the first time to judge the Father's enemy that we call sin, currently, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father until the appointed time when he comes back to judge sinners, thereby purging the world of corruption of all kinds. Right? He judged sin the first time and gave all people a chance to receive forgiveness so that we don't have to be condemned in his judgments when he comes back to judge people who reject the offer of forgiveness and remain sinners in his sight. He's going to come back to deal with them. And it's that judgment that will facilitate the distribution of pleasures forevermore. It will last forever because the world will be without corruption of any kind forever. It's Jesus' judgments that cleanse the world of everything negative and terrible that corrupts the good things that God wants to do for us, right? That's why his judgments and his blessings are so intimately connected. Now, the things that King David wrote about in Psalm 21 weren't much different from the things that he wrote about in Psalm 110. The right hand of God searches out the enemies of God to purge and destroy the things that corrupt his eternal purposes and promises. Jesus is the one that does this work as the Son of God, which means God in flesh. He does this as the Messiah of Israel, the Anointed One, appointed to fulfill all of the Father's eternally unconditional promises. He's the King of Kings in this sense, which is why David referred to him as his master. This all means that the language of Psalm 21, verses 8 through 13, speaks about the work that Jesus will do in the future. Pretty crazy, right? Look at the tone of David's writings there as they relate to the second coming of Jesus Christ. God will seek out particular individuals that deny him, hate him, and oppose him. Psalm 21, verses 8 through 12, sound a lot like Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 2. And here's what it says there. It says, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. So these verses from Revelation document this awesome heavenly response to Jesus' work, the work that he does to destroy and judge the spirit of all false religion. Now, why false religion? Well, according to the Bible, it's been that issue that has caused so much grief and pain and suffering and death for so many of God's people. And that's a subject all on its own that could be its own eternally unending podcast. (laughs) These evils have directly opposed God's purposes and righteousness for a long time. And Jesus has an appointment to settle this issue. In Psalm 21, David wrote that, God will judge using a fiery oven at the appointed time to swallow up evil in his fiery wrath so that evil will not have an opportunity and ability to reproduce or procreate in the midst of his people ever again. So in Revelation 19, verses 17 through 21, here's what it says there. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured. And with him, the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Jeez. So the testimony of Revelation 19, 17 through 21, describes the events that come directly after the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus will come with the wrath of the Lord God Almighty 
to judge everyone that opposes him, who opposes his people and his own purposes. Jesus will utterly destroy them and cast them, as we see, into the lake of fire as the physical manifestation of God's wrath, right? Again, the Father desires this, the right hand of God, the physical manifestation and extension of his ideas gets it done, and that's Jesus. The language of Psalm 21, verses 8 through 13, clearly points to the events that surround the return of Jesus Christ, at which point the Father will fulfill his promise to purge sin, corruption, and opposition from the midst of his people by the power of his right hand. Now, knowing this, we need to carefully think about the final statement that David made in Psalm 21, representing the proclamation of this victorious king that's described throughout. Here's what it says in the last verse. Be exalted, O Lord, in your own strength. We will sing and praise your power. So what is the desire of the triumphant king that trusts in the Lord, right? What is the desire of those who have received the blessing of God? What is the desire of the heart that God fulfills? Look, what's God's own desire here? What do we learn from all this? The scriptures show that the desire of the king's heart is the revelation of Jesus Christ in glory to administrate the righteousness and justice of God here on earth. Now, it doesn't say those specific exact things, but when we put all of the contents of scripture together to fit these puzzle pieces in their proper order, this is the picture that we're left with. The king desires for the Messiah of Israel to come into the world to do the work that God promised to do to purge sin, death, and evil from this place. The king desires this because God desires this. God doesn't want sin lingering around, messing up his good stuff, messing with his people, messing with his purposes. He's not going to contend with darkness and evil forever. The Bible makes a compelling case that God's chief focus is actually the revelation of Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Messiah in glory at the second coming. Why? Jesus will come again to fulfill perfect righteousness, at which point the rest of the Father's promises can be fulfilled. All that good stuff, right? But he's going to do that through the destruction of all evil in this world. He's not going to distribute the blessings to their full and maximum degree in the midst of all this corruption. This is how the king is able to triumph. This is how God's people gain victory. This is why the apostle Paul wrote this to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. He said, Finally, there is laid up for me a, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So in Psalm 21, 3, it mentioned a crown given to the victorious king by God. Paul also referred to a crown being given by God. God is the administrator and distributor of both of these crowns. The crowns are essentially one and the same. We can look to the words of Paul to understand the words of David in Psalm 21. Paul wrote that those who love his appearing will receive the crown that God desires to give. So the people who get this crown in the end love the appearing of God. Well, who is he referring to? Remember, that's the same desire as the victorious king. In 2 Timothy Paul was referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ, especially when he said that day. That's what he's referring to. Those who love and long for the return of Jesus will receive the crown that's referred to there. The people who supremely desire to see the Father's eternally unconditional promises fulfilled through his promised anointed one, right? Jesus Christ, fulfilling all of the Father's purposes through his righteous judgments, so that he can distribute the goodness of his rewards to his servants, those are the ones that will share in Jesus' victory and receive those rewards. This is the desire of God. His desire is to bless his people, but he's not going to do that without judging. This should also be the desire of God's people. Look, the more that God reveals his righteousness and power to us by the word, and we see the necessity of his judgments so that we can gain the goodness of his blessings, the more we should want to do away with evil, including the evil influence of our own flesh, because we're being conformed into his image, right? We learn and realize that sin, even our own, corrupts the goodness of God's blessings. So that's what we desire. We desire God to remove all of the things that corrupt his blessings, starting with our own hearts, 
but then of course, extending out into the entire world and even the universe. When we get there, then we start to want his purposes more than our own and see those things fulfilled in our life. That's what the Bible teaches about the one that we know as God. So before I get out of here, I just wanted to give you a quick reminder. Please keep in mind that all of the Bible teaching I do here is 100% listener supported. This means that I depend on listeners like you to pay the bills for the tools that make this stuff available to you, as well as pay for all the time that it takes to study the word and prepare to this degree. The support I get from this podcast also helps fund the other ministry projects that I'm working on to help get the true and full gospel of Jesus Christ out into a very dark and lost generation as widely as possible. Look, if this podcast is helpful and valuable to you, please prayerfully consider sending a donation this way. This ministry, look, it's a legit nonprofit 501c3 organization operating through our parent ministry, which is called Proper Knowledge Ministries. If you'd like to partner with the work of the gospel that I'm doing, you can visit www.pastorbside.com, like the flip side of a record. The link is in the description. When you get there, hit the donate tab, and then you can give any amount that you're able as the Lord leads you. Every bit helps. And if you're down, maybe even consider partnering monthly with me, making your gift recurring, kind of like tithing to a church. Because church is founded on the true teaching of the Bible. That's exactly what I'm trying to do here. Something to think about, something to pray about. So again, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the study. Don't forget to share this with friends and family. And until next time, peace out.